Hi, welcome to Head Start, the podcast for race directors and the business of putting on races. If you've done the hard work of prospecting and soliciting sponsors and got some of your prospects to engage with you, you may be forgiven in thinking your job is done. Well, actually, that's where the real work begins, understanding your sponsor's needs and closing the deal with a sponsorship proposal that hits all the right notes. So, how do you get into your sponsor's head? How do you put together a sponsorship proposal that clicks with them while maximizing the value you get out of a potential deal? And how do you gather clues on what a sponsor might be willing to pay before you actually submit your proposal to them? That's what we'll be discussing today with returning guest, Green Cactus CEO, Teresa Stas. It's a pleasure to have Teresa back on the podcast after our very popular chat back in episode 40 last September on finding and approaching sponsors. And today we're taking the next step on the sponsorship sales journey to look at the challenges and secrets behind researching, preparing and delivering a winning sponsorship proposal. Among other things, we're going to be looking at the all-important discovery session where you get to spend time understanding the sponsor's needs before submitting your proposal, as well as some very useful tips on efficiently drafting customized proposals and navigating the negotiations that hopefully will get to follow your proposal submission. So, if you're at that stage in your sponsorship discussions where you need to submit a sponsorship proposal or you feel your game might be falling short in that department, Stick around for an episode packed with tips and practical advice from our resident sponsorship pro. Now, before we get into all that, I'd like to give a quick shout out to our amazing podcast sponsor, Run Sign Up, race director's favorite all-in-one technology solution for endurance and fundraising events. More than 28,000 in-person, virtual and hybrid events use Run Sign Up's free and integrated solution to save time, grow their events and raise more. And we'll be hearing a bit more from this great company a little later in the podcast. But now, let's dive into our discussion on sponsorship proposals with Green Cactus CEO, Teresa Stas. Teresa, welcome back to the podcast. Ah, thank you very much for having me. Thank you for taking the time to join me again on the podcast. I really appreciate it. How have you been? We've been great, super, super busy, but um, but having a great time. And we've, I've, uh, I say we like the royal we, but um, I felt very lucky because after the last podcast, you've had several listeners reach out and, and say hello and ask questions, and it's been great. Well, it was an awesome episode. Uh, we're going to be touching on uh, that in a sec. What we went through there, because I think it's going to be a great introduction for what we discuss today. Before that, tell me how things are going with um, Hood to Coast. I think you were telling me it's just around the corner. The event. Yes, Hood to Coast is just around the corner and it's bigger and better than ever. So we're very excited to see how that's going to develop. And they've also had a lot of the different races too, the spinoff races. So um, really excited for that one, that one's happening in August. I mean, we should remind people who are not aware of this, Hood to Coast in the Pacific Northwest is the biggest relay in the world. It's quite an amazing event. And I think they've spun it off, right? I think they're doing... It has, yes. It's been franchised out. So now it's international too. There's several different uh, versions of it all over the the world. So it's it's very exciting. It has a waiting list of 30,000 people, just to give you a perspective. They actually have to do a lottery to to be able to pick those, um, those who get to run it. So it's a really exciting event. And sponsorship wise, I wonder, because you work with those guys for quite a while, is there anything kind of like new going on for 2023 or is it bread and butter stuff, same stuff as last year kind of thing? Um, you know, there's always something new with that event. And with I think with a lot of our events, there's always some new innovations, different ways of doing things. I think the biggest trend that we see on with that event as well as with just overall in general is more the cause marketing, having um, having brands that align with the cause of the of the um event or like in this case, the race. So, um, cancer research is really important to them. So a lot of the, the brands align with that or have some way of, you know, helping raise funds for that. So cause marketing has been the bit really big trend for the last couple of years that I've seen events lean into. And for a large event of that size and prestige, do you guys get uh, non-endemic sponsors, uh, you know, apart from, you know, like the usual running stuff and this and that? Like, do you get in, any banks or any kind of like insurance companies? Yes, uh, absolutely. Well, I mean, one of the one of the big 
sponsors for this year for Hood to Coast's first tech credit union, which is a, a credit, you know, union. Um, then there's also uh, like we just partnered up with Ubco, which is this amazing um, electric. It's like an electric motorcycle. Um, so a lot of people wouldn't think of it as, you know, necessarily something you would apply to a race because it's uh, it's this bike, basically a motorcycle, but it um, works out great because the staff use it actually to set up the, 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 you know, the track and the trails and stuff because it's 200 miles, this race is. So um, it's hard to set those kind of things up, you know, using cars all the time. And those, that audience tends to want to use, do adventure in, in all aspects. So that's something that's a great fit that, that is just coming in. So we see a lot of different things. Understanding your audience, like I always say, is the way to find out if it's a good fit. And sometimes it doesn't seem like something you would be like automatically associate with, with the group. But we found that, you know, yes, you can get all kinds of sponsors, especially for events like this. Indeed. Understanding your audience, your first pillar that we touched yeah. on the previous episode. So. The previous episode, when you last came on, was, um, I just checked, back in September of last year, 2022, if people want to look that up. But for those of us who are joining us on this episode for the first time, do you want to maybe um, remind us all what you do and what Green Cactus does and all of that stuff? Yes, of course. So I, a lot of people in the industry know me because I'm the author of the book, Sell Your Event. It's the easy to follow guide. A practical guide to getting sponsors. We also have a workbook along that comes along with it. Um, I'm the CEO of, of the um, live event sponsorship agency called Green Cactus. And we are basically everything an event would need for sponsorships when it comes to the live event world. And we do races and things, but we don't do pro sports. And there's a lot of that too. I mean, it's either pro sports or it's um, or you're on your own. Um, so we, we focus on midsize, uh, and large events. Um, and we're brokers and we can talk a little bit more about what that does or how that works, but we also help manage sponsorships on site at, at large events as well. Um, and then I'm, I'm a national speaker and I, um, go around and teach people about sponsorships and, um, how to get the most, uh, um, out of those for their different live events. And so we handle a uh, live events from all over from like music festivals are our specialty, but we do, um, have, like I said, Hood to Coast and these, um, and, uh, their race series as well. So we are familiar with that, that market too. Indeed. And I have to say, as we were discussing also before we came on air, that the last episode we did was super popular with people. You said, you know, people were reaching out to you saying thanks yeah, it was for nice. a few things. Yeah. And I, and I also got lots of comments about how helpful it was. It was like really great practical advice hopefully very similar to what today's episode is going to be. Yeah. So uh, it's great to have you back. You take a very methodical approach to the sponsorship process, which is also reflected in your book. So you break it down in steps because we're going to be sort of like picking up where we left off on the previous episode in terms of the process. I just wanted to remind people what we discussed in our previous chat. So people can perhaps go back and, and listen to that. I would actually strongly advise that if they haven't. So. The very first step of your approach, which we sort of touched on a minute ago, is understanding your audience. And we spoke quite a lot about that. Basically, what information you need to know about your audience and how to obtain that. So you build like a good understanding of who it is that you can bring to the table. And then it's building an introduction deck. And this is something that you see some people, you know, like it's sort of in some people's process and not in others. I think it's a great idea. This introduction deck, as we discussed on the last episode, is not quite a sponsorship proposal. In fact, it's it's very different to a sponsorship proposal, although some bits of it may go into the sponsorship proposal, right? It's more of a kind of like general brochure, you know, like this is my event, this is my audience, right? This is kind of like the assets, right? A little bit about us right. kind of kind of deck. Uh, lots of nice photos in there, particularly for races. That's what we mentioned last time around, right? Yeah, yeah. And then we also spoke about uh, prospecting, which is, I think, one of the toughest bits of the whole sponsorship process, which is how to research suitable sponsors, um, whom to approach, 
all of that kind of stuff. Correct. And then where we sort of wrapped up, which is a great place now to pick up from, was um, making that first approach, which is also quite important, right? And you have some great examples, both in your book and your workbook that I remember reading on uh, about cold calling scripts and cold emailing scripts and all of that stuff. Because I know people are, I know I would be, you know, quite terrified of cold calling in general, <laughs> right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Let, let alone sponsors where people are even more reluctant to reach out to, right? So Absolutely, it's, yeah. It's a really important process. And actually, not only not only um, what to say in that first approach, but also finding the right contact, which is another hurdle that, right, that people sort of like stumble yeah. over, right? Like, whom do I reach out to? What do, what does their role say, right? How, like, how, how do I know who to contact? So for anyone who hasn't listened to that episode, I strongly advise going back to it and going through all of these areas. So now we're going to be picking up from there, right? So essentially we have, We've picked up the phone. We've sent our cold email, right? Correct. Um, we haven't gotten um, the door shut yeah. <laughs> in our face quite. Correct. Yep. So, right. So we have one foot through the door. People are sort of like interested. And now we want to move into getting more details from the sponsor, right? In order to reach the point where we can actually put a proposal to them. So I'd really be keen to hear from you. Because I know this is a step that some people would be tempted to try and get around. Why having this discovery session is that important? Yeah, so a lot of people um, tend to create what they their proposal and then they just mass email it out to a whole bunch of people. Um, or they mass email out their levels to um to a whole bunch of uh, their prospect list that they put together and they don't actually engage or have a conversation prior to. And I think the thing that people need to realize is that, yes, you can, you could definitely create all these packages or these levels and send them out to everyone as a group. And, um, and maybe if you send out a hundred, you might get five that buy into it. Okay. But the thing is, is that you at this point have now, told when you do this, you're telling that person on the other end that you do not care what they need or what their goals are or what they're trying to achieve from their investment, because this is not a donation. And we have to make that distinction very clear, because especially in races, a lot of times in the race world, um, there's some sort of nonprofit tied to this. But when you're asking for sponsorships, you're asking for them to make a marketing investment in your event. So you're not asking them to just donate. So when you're doing any kind of marketing um, or any kind of brand or company is doing marketing, they are trying to understand what their goal is and what they're trying to achieve out of that. And when you just send off a proposal or a three pager with a bunch of levels on it, what you're saying is, you have to fit your goal into one of these packages. And what happens is a lot of times they look at the four options and they say, well, that one, I don't want to spend that kind of money. I don't need a whole bunch of logos on stuff, or maybe their goal is completely different and they need some sort of space or whatever. And so instead of going back and trying to talk to you about different options or things like that, they just shut it and move on to the next one because it's not worth, you're not engaging or trying to find out how you can help them because it is a, a partnership in some regards because you're trying to help them to reach a certain marketing goal and all marketing goals are different. And like just a, a quick, like for instance, Red Bull, you know, Red Bull can be a part of a lot of different races or, or adventure activities, things like that. Red Bull doesn't like their logo on stuff. So if you sent them a proposal with a bunch of stuff that has to do with logos, they're most likely going to say no, because that is not a priority for them, nor do they really like it. They don't like to be in what they call logo soup. So there are different um, goals for different brands. And if you don't take the time to find out what it is that they like to do, then you are immediately shutting your your you're shutting the door for them 90% of the time. The other time is the discovery call allows you to find out 
what things they can do, what things have been um, worked out for them. You know, it, it gives you a chance to get an understanding and you might end up getting more money than you thought you would get. Um, because that's the other thing is we don't ever get any large dollar amounts sold because of levels. Never. It's always, we'll always get more because we actually have a conversation with them and we, and we tailor it to them, if that makes sense. And I think there's also a kind of like human principle in all this, involved in all this, that I also, people use this kind of example also in the context of any kind of negotiation, which is invested time by both parties, right? It's part of getting to a deal, right? I mean, when, when both parties engage time in it, they feel more invested in something when they start down that road. Yep, absolutely. And the thing is, you know, too, if they're willing to spend the time and take the time to make the call, then there is a real interest there, which is why we do the, what we call, I mean, a lot of people just call it a deck. I identify it as an introduction deck because I want to make it clear that you don't put prices or create a proposal or do packages in this deck. It gives them a chance to understand what they're looking at, a chance to engage with you on ways that they can be a part of your event in a successful way. And then it helps you put something together where they will be successful. Because if you're just trying to cram them into a box or into a level, then it may not create success for them. And if it creates success for them, then they will continue to stay with you and you won't be reselling everything every single year. And that's the other part of it. And in your opinion, what is the best way to get a sponsor that I've got on the phone or I'm, I'm, I'm chatting with over email to actually spend the time with me on a discovery call or on a follow-up session to actually go through all of these questions? How do I get them to agree to that? So the way the what we have discovered in years and what I've learned too is as well is that if your event is a good fit or if the brand is interested in looking at your event, which is why you do the introduction deck, a lot of times they are willing to spend the time. Um, the thing I would make very clear is that you want to make it short. I would not spend more than, um, you know, aim to try and take only about 15 minutes. Um, if they're engaging with you and having a conversation, it might end up in 30 minutes, but it shouldn't really be more than that and have a good understanding of what you're trying to achieve from them. Um, those that are interested in your event and are willing to take the most of the time, that will, they will be willing to take the time. It's the ones who don't respond to you or who won't take your calls or like, we, we're really busy. We don't have time for this. I'm going to be honest with you. They're probably not really interested um, because if they are, then they are 90% of the time are willing to take the time. Um, sometimes we can send it to them in, you know, an email, but a lot of times it's a really quick phone call. They tell you what they're interested in, what they like, what they don't like, that kind of thing. And, and I have some questions you can ask them to kind of get yourself you know, in that conversation. But if they're not willing to spend the 10 or 15 minutes, they're probably not interested in your event, to be honest, to, to begin with. Sponsors sometimes drop the ball as much as rights holders, right? Oh, yes. C could it yeah. be I'm talking to someone perhaps who doesn't understand the etiquette or doesn't understand the value of a, of a discovery session themselves, right? And they're all like, yeah, yeah, you know, like just send me what you got kind of thing. Like, or is the only way to interpret that, that they're not interested or they want to just, you know, like dismiss? No, me? no. Yeah, no. So that's that you bring up a good point. Um, what we find is, is that the ones that tend to really push to get, um, you know, send me your options or uh, just send me what you have and we'll look over it or whatever. Those that tend to really push that. Um, either A, are not interested, B, they tend to be more local sponsors, um, more localized because they do not deal with um, with this kind of ask on a regular basis, or they do, and it's all from the same size kind of event um, that is that's, that's the way they've always done it. You know, they don't really know. They'll pick, they're, they're what we call community sponsors. You know, they're going to pick anywhere from, they're willing to spend 500, a thousand dollars maybe, but they're not going to invest in large dollars, um, those kinds of things. So yes, you could potentially have those. Um, we do have them every once in a while that are really pushy. Like we don't care to send us something 
when that happens, sometimes we'll send, you know, maybe a couple of options that we've thought they might be a good fit for, and we'll send those over. But I would tell you 90% of the time when that is the case, they don't buy it. So, um, but you can definitely do that. Or you can say, here's some options that we've kind of put together that we thought you might, but we're taking a stab in the dark. So please feel free to chat with us about it, or we can tailor it to fit your needs or, you know, and, and every once in a while, they'll look at something and be like, oh, okay, that's kind of cool. That's sort of interesting. Can we adjust this or can we adjust this? Um, but I think it means that you really need to understand what that brand is the be- to the best of your ability and come up with something that looks that, that, would be what you think would be a good fit for them. Um, so that's, that's kind of the thought I would have with that. But in our experience, a lot of times if they're not willing to spend the 10 or 15 minutes on a call and you could just say, it's, you know, I just want to take a 10 or 15 minutes so we can find out the best ways that we can work together or the best ways we can partner together or what's a good fit for your brand or what it looks or what are your goals or what are you guys trying to get out of your sponsorships? You know, that's kind of how we start with it. Um, so that's, that's sort of my, my rule of thumb, but yes, we do get people who are really, who do push back and they're like, we, you know, please just send us something or give us, you know, a couple of options and we will, we don't ignore it. I know some um, sponsorship people are like, if you're not willing to spend the 10 minutes or the 15 minutes, then it's probably not a good fit. And then they don't do it at all. Um, We will, we'll, we'll always kind of take a stab at the dark on it, but if we're not getting engagement at all, um, then we don't waste our time putting it out there. Okay. Crystal clear. And in terms of the questions you would ask the sponsor during that meeting as sort of the objectives of the whole thing, what should you be thinking about? Yeah. So a couple of things I always recommend to people is, first of all, make sure you understand the brand and what it is or what it does or you know what it's trying to fulfill as far as the need that the brand is trying to fulfill. So uh, you don't have to go in with all with with a a ton of research. I know there's some um, sponsorship people who ha- like have this whole they understand all their marketing and things like that. I have found that a lot of times um, what may be publicly considered their marketing plan is not always internally what they're aiming for co- moving forward. So I try not to come in with too much expectation of what. I would get out of them because that way I can hear what they're trying to say. So um, the the main questions I always try to ask is, what are your sponsorship goals? Um, what do you hope to achieve from sponsoring our event? So you want to understand what the goal is, what they're trying to achieve. Are they trying to get leads? Are they are they trying to get data? Are they trying to get awareness? Are they trying to get um entertain guests. I mean, like, are they trying to, what, what is it that they're trying to do while sponsoring? Because they are all very different. So if you're trying to get data and lead, like, let's say you want to get, um, cause a big common one is, you know, collecting sales leads or something like that. Let's say it's a car dealer and they want you to take, collect people's information who might be interested in buying a car. Um, then it doesn't necessarily mean that their logo needs to be on everything. Um, so you want to tailor that kind of stuff. The next thing is, can you share an example of a past sponsorship that you consider successful? So what has worked in the past? What hasn't worked in the past? Understanding kind of things that they've done before and things that have worked for them versus things that haven't worked for them will help save you time so that you're not trying to recreate the wheel every time. Um, You know, if they say, I did a contest and it worked really well for us, well, then maybe you create a contest. If they say, I did a contest and it was terrible and we we hated the experience, then you know to eliminate that out of out of your proposal. Um, the next one I say is how will you measure um, the success of this sponsorship? Because that's a big hiccup that a lot of events don't realize. Um, an example of that is like if I said, um, I'm going to give you, you know, 100 coupons to put inside your race bags. And then um, you are so excited because you're like, oh, my gosh, we actually gave out, you know, 400 coupons when we were only going to do a hundred, you know, we had 400 of them went out and you're like, Oh, this is great. This is a success. 
And then, um, so you're happy with it, but then what happens is let's say that they were measuring it by how many people actually went into the restaurant with those coupons. And let's say they only got 10 people or something. So it's, you know, 10% or whatever. So for you, you might've thought, oh, we distributed 400 coupons. That's a success. And for the brand, they might've said, well, we only had 10 coupons redeemed. So that's a fail. So if you knew at the beginning that the the way they're going to measure it is how many to, how many coupons have been redeemed, then you can be more strategic in the way you issue those. So maybe it's, you know, you're doing like a pre-party at the restaurant to get more people to use the coupons, or maybe it's, uh, you know, so you can come up more with, uh, with ways to actually target what the actual measurement tool is versus just assuming that that's how they're going to figure it. That's how they're going to measure it. Um, the next question is, uh, is there anything from the asset list or is there any a sort of things that you like to have in your sponsorships? What are important to you? You know, are tickets important to you? Are activation space important to you? What are things that you really want to see in your, in your proposal? Because, you know, we'll get a lot of sponsors who don't really care about their logos being on everything. I mean, that honestly is probably the biggest one. Or we do a lot of music festivals, like I said. And we have a lot of big brands. People assume that, oh, if I give them a, you know, a, a stack of tickets, that that's considered a sponsorship. And uh, most of our national brands could care less about the tickets. So valuing those tickets inside of your package is not a, that's not of importance to them. So understanding what's important to them is another thing. And then the last one I will always ask too is um, when do you expect to see the proposal by? What you want to do is after you have that call with them, you repeat back what you heard. Like I hear, what I'm hearing from you is that, you know, logos aren't important. Tickets are important. Um, you'd like to see your name on a race bib and you want to do a contest to capture leads. Then they would say, yes, that works for you. And you say, okay, if I can get the proposal to you, you know, by next week, does that work for you? You know, and a lot, sometimes they'll say, well, if I had it by Friday, that'd be better because I'm going into this meeting or they'll say, oh yeah, we got plenty of time. You can get it to us next month. You know, that gives you sort of a, a, a point of how important it is. So that's, those are my main um, questions when it comes to that. You can also ask about budget if you wanted to as well. Yeah, I think that's a great point. Again, a more general point about lots of things, which is summarizing back what you think you understood to the person giving you the information, right? It's, it's so easy. And by definition, it's something you don't pick up on, right? To misunderstand right. something or you think that you understood something, but not exactly in the right way. So basically, as you say, saying some stuff back to the sponsor, I'm hearing this and I, this is what I understood. It's really important sort of like avoiding misunderstanding down the line. Budgets, you mentioned, obviously a very sensitive topic when you're, uh, you know, preparing a sponsorship proposal. It's almost like, you know, like asking the other party to, you know, to, to strip bear or something, right? <laughs> yes, exactly. Is that something you would advise doing during a discovery session? Basically prodding, I guess, you know, like general budgety type tolerances from the sponsor? Yeah, I know that this is sort of, if you're not used to doing it, this can be an awkward question or you're not quite sure how to bring it up. Um, and the way that I handle it, the, the, the biggest reason why I ask about budgets is not so that I can tap out someone's budget or come up with the biggest sponsorship that's going to take all the money or something like that. Because your pricing should be pretty much your pricing. You should have already have that kind of established. But um, the reason why I do it is because there's I have learned the hard way in my many years of doing this is that um, there's often times, especially when you're dealing with a brand or a sponsor that that is newer um, that you haven't worked with very often. There's often times this this sort of breakdown where they you may be talking about a sponsorship after talking to them and you're maybe suggesting ideas or you've got some stuff going on and you're in your head and you're thinking oh great this sponsorship's going to be let's say $20,000 and in their head they think the sponsorship's going to be $2,000 and when you have when you go back and you pitch something like that and you have a disparity the disparities against those two right there it's very hard to come back it's really hard to bridge that gap between 2000 and 20,000. So, um, when you're so far off, majority of the time, they'll just not take it at all. So for me, 
having an understanding of what they're thinking versus what I'm thinking helps save you time all around. Um, so we have a lot, we have several events that have minimums when it comes to sponsorships, like a majority of our events will, we don't even start at sponsorships. Um, the minimum is $5,000. That's very common for a lot of the events we do. So, um, and we'll sometimes get new brands. And as I'm talking to them, I'm like, oh my God, they love all the things we're coming up with. And then I'll realize, you know, oh, they think that this is going to be like a $3,000 or $4,000 sponsorship. And, and we don't even start at that. So I don't want to waste my time putting together a proposal if they're not prepared to spend that kind of money. And, um, they are, I don't want to waste their time having to go through all of this and it not be the same. So what I try to do is I, um, when you get better at it, the more you do it, the better you're going to get. But when you get better at it, what I like to do sometimes is I'll listen to everything, what they're kind of saying. And then sometimes I can kind of talk off the top of my head and say, okay, what we've discussed right here, that's probably going to fall somewhere between five and $10,000. Does that sound reasonable to you? And if you do it like that, then a lot of times they'll say, oh yeah, that should work. And if they say, oh yeah, that should work. And they don't really blink much about it. Then you know that you could maybe go up some or maybe give them a couple of options that are a little more expensive. Um, if they're like, oh no, 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 that's too much money. Or we're really, it's kind of funny. Cause a lot of times you say, do you have a budget you would like me to work with then? Because that's the other nice thing is when you're doing it customized, you can do it as a favor to them. Is there a budget you'd like me to work with then? And sometimes they think you're going to take whatever they give you and that you're going to spend all of it. Um, and let's be honest, a lot of salespeople, that's what we're going to do. I mean, I, if I hear a budget, then I'm like, well, maybe I'll give them an option that goes up that high. Um, so you want to... When you do it that way, when you say, you know, is there a budget you want me to stay within? And sometimes they're like, well, we just want to see what you put together. Um, then, then that's when I'll go into, well, what we're talking about kind of sounds like a five to ten thousand dollars, or it sounds like a twenty to thirty thousand dollars. And then if they say, oh no, 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 that's too high, then you have a better understanding of what you're working with. And a lot of times, fun, the funny enough is when that conversation starts like that, then they'll tend to say, well, I kind of want to say something under 5,000. At that point, then they start to tend to give you a budget to stay with them. Um, and then if they say, oh, no, that sounds great, or that's perfect, or, you know, then you kind of know that you have a little leeway. So I really do suggest asking that question. I know it's an awkward question. Um, if you do it more as a I uh, just, you know, I'm trying to help you out. Let me know so I can keep within your budget. You're doing it as, as you're trying to help make sure that you're doing, you're creating a proposal that is beneficial to them so that they can get what they need, their goals within their budget. Then that is very helpful. Um, if you decide you don't want to work, you know, you don't want to do a, a sponsorship that's a thousand dollars or two thousand dollars. Maybe it's too much work or something like that. Then you can say, Oh, I understand. You know, I get that. Unfortunately, a lot of our, sponsorships start, you know, around the $4,000 mark, around the $5,000 mark, then it can help you um, eliminate the time that is going to waste if you are like, I'm not going to spend my time on a bunch of $500 sponsorships. Then at that point, you can step away and you've now, you haven't wasted your time sending it off. You haven't wasted your time developing a proposal, you know, that kind of thing. But the, it is a skill set that you have to keep practicing um, to make it natural so that you don't feel like you're asking but the majority of those people are are fine with it, you know, and nobody is going to take it. They'll just tell you straight out if they have a budget or they don't have a budget or if they just want to see what you have to, you know, what you have to put together. So um, I think that's the biggest key is it just helps save time and also make sure that your your proposal is going to fit within something they can, you know, they can actually do. Yeah, I think that makes sense. And it goes back to the whole point about that we discussed earlier about even asking the sponsor for some time to go into the discovery call to begin with, which is that this is all expected in kind of like, you know, in sponsorship negotiations, right? I mean, a professional on the other end would take this in a nice way because, you know, presumably they've been there before, they've been asked that question before, and they understand where you're coming from, right? It's almost like, yes. you know, when you get weird reactions 
it's almost like a sign, as we were saying earlier about, you know, like asking for a call that you're probably have someone on the other end who, you know, may not, maybe a little bit more junior, or not very familiar with this stuff. Yes, yes. This is all very common, very common. Yes. So you've got all that information, which is super valuable. And one more thing, actually, I would say in defense of the whole discovery call is that, and most race directors uh, would appreciate this, is that even getting to this stage is already such a rare occurrence that you just wouldn't want to waste the chance to go on a discovery call, right? I mean, how many shots at this are you going to get? So if you've, if, you're, if you've gone this far, you may as well just take the time and do things properly. Which, by the way, moving then on to the sponsorship proposal, again, you've cleared quite a few hurdles. You definitely don't want to be sending out like a generic tier packages type thing with no personalization whatsoever to the sponsor's goals, right? Right. Absolutely. So once you have the information, then the the goal here is to create a proposal that is tailored to the information that they have told you. So that's why you're repeating it back. That is going to aim to achieve their goals. And so that's, that's the biggest um, thing about this proposal. Now, when I tell people that I do custom proposals and that our agency only does custom proposals, they think that every single proposal is started from scratch and that, you know, we build it out every time. And that is not the case. So um, we do have, you know, like an asset, um, a list, a detailed inventory of our assets. And we do this with all of our properties. Um, And we do have pricing for them. And we do have certain sponsorships that we are trying to sell. Um, A lot of times we'll have different categories that we're focusing on. Like, is it, I'll use a a music festival just for, for general. Um, but like, you know, we'll have like, okay, we know we want to do a stage sponsor. We'd like to do, um, maybe we want to do a bar sponsor. Maybe we have a silent disco or something we're going to brand, or we're going to do a, um, we want to make sure our parking lot is, you know, maybe sponsored free parking by Lexus or, you know, something like that. So we'll have different ideas of different areas that are important to the property that we are trying to pitch. So I'm a big fan of real estate. So when I when I do sponsorships, I tend to tie them into some different types of real estate on uh, for an event. But um, so maybe it's a you know a bib sponsors, or maybe it's you're doing race bag sponsors, or you know you can have different categories of what you're trying to aim for. And we do what we call asset sheets, and we develop out what those look like. So, you know, the here's a stage sponsor. If we're going to do a stage sponsor, then this is the things that are going to get, or this is the things we can offer them. Not necessarily that they have to take them all, but this is what we're going to offer them. Having these kind of things kind of pre-prepared, which are similar to having your levels um, on the back end is fine. And, but then you're going to go in, you're going to pull those pieces and put them into this proposal so that they fit what they said. Because like I said, let's say you're talking to a Red Bull and they're like, we want, you know, we want to do a sampling activation or we want our team to be able to give out Red Bulls as people are running or whatever. Then that way you're making it clear to what they're trying to achieve and you're taking out the parts that they don't want, like the logo placement on the t-shirts or logos on the bibs or whatever you would put in your regular levels. You take that stuff out. Don't give them stuff just for the sake of giving it to them. You know, you want to make them tailored. That way you're also making the people who do want logos on stuff, you're making that more valuable to them because you're not putting, you know, 25 logos on the back of a t-shirt. You're making it more valuable to the people who really do want that kind of thing. So um, tailoring it actually helps everybody involved, not just that brand, but also um, all your other brands too, because you're not just throwing stuff th- on it to make it seem like it's a value. Yeah. And I guess sending someone a ready off the shelf proposal after you've had the meeting with them is is doubly criminal, right? Because it says, you know, I spent 10 minutes with you and I just still sent you the generic thing, right? I mean, that's that's even more criminal. Yeah. And we've had, uh, we've had calls where we we listen to them and then it's like, oh, well, this pre-package that we already have actually fits for them. So we pull it out and we'll put it in there, but it doesn't look gen- generic. It's not like, okay, we've just talked to you. Now here's a list of my bronze, you know, my gold, silver, bronze. 
options, pick one of those. It's not like that. It's like, here's yours. We'll do option A, option B, you know, kind of based on what they say. I always, in my proposals, do three options normally, unless it's very specific at what they're looking for. If there's something very specific, then we'll do it that way. But I try to do three options. I try to keep them somewhat within their budget. Like maybe it's the very basic bottom of the budget, then it's, you know, um, mid-level, which is pretty much usually what they'll end up taking. And then maybe something that we think is a good fit that we maybe, we, maybe we didn't necessarily discuss it with them, but we thought, you know, these are a couple of things they're looking for. So maybe we'll give them a, you know, maybe a stage sponsorship is worth looking at. Um, and the reason why we do options too, is very interesting as there's a book, I think I brought it up in the last podcast, but it's called the science of selling. And, um, there's been a lot of, uh, behavior science that is tied to how people make decisions. And a lot of times if you give them three options, then they tend to choose one. If you give them one option and they don't like it, then they just tap out. They don't, they're not a part of it. Um, And then sometimes with the two, I always give an option. Always. I mean, I would always choose two because with the research and everything, it seems to be that the choices are, are usually made when there's three. So if you have two, that's fine. But then they sort of, your brain pits itself on which is the better one. But for some reason, when it's three, they it feels like it's making a better decision. It's kind of an interesting uh, thought. But so we always try to do three, but I always give them some options just so they can kind of see different ideas or different ways that they can incorporate their brand into our, into our events. When it comes to sponsorship, closing sponsors is only part of the job. Keeping them happy is where the real work begins. And fortunately for you, Run Sign Up, the trusted provider of all the technology you'll ever need for your event, has a few things up its sleeve to help you along the way. With Run Sign Up Sponsor Management System, you can easily control how your sponsors are promoted through your race website and how they appear on your event emails. You can choose to send out to your participants dedicated emails on behalf of your sponsors with offers and other information and even include watermarks of your sponsor brands on your race photos, which is a great way, by the way, to incentivize sponsors to pay for your free race photos if you choose to go down that road. You can also design custom email templates that nicely incorporate your sponsor branding and set up fully custom pages on your race website to share your sponsor's stories with your participants and website visitors. And when the time comes to put together a sponsorship proposal or send that next monthly update to your sponsors, Run Signup's data reporting tools can help you save tons of time collecting and compiling the data you need with instant data exports in all major data formats and great graph visualizations. You can just copy and paste straight into your sponsor reports. So, to learn more about Run Signup's sponsor activation capabilities and many other great features, head over to runsignup.com. That's runsignup.com and see why over 28,000 events are using Run Signup's industry-leading technology to take the races to the next level. Okay, now let's get back to the episode. So let's do like a quick dissect of what the sponsorship proposal looks like. So what kind of sections should I expect to see in there and sort of roughly what would be your proposed order? So if you had listened to the first podcast, we talked a little bit about the introduction deck, what I call an introduction deck. A lot of people just call it a deck. So you would want to put the pieces that are in there. So we always want to do a cover. You want, when you're doing that, make sure you're putting your contact information clearly on there, your event, the date, all of that is on the cover, but your information is key because a lot of times that those proposals are going to get separated from your email. They're going to get printed off. They're going to get passed around. So you want to make sure that no matter where they're at, they can just look down and get your number, your email address. So then you'll want to make sure you have all of your, like what I call the, the sort of the information, the need to know, um, it's all your basic stuff. First, you'll have your about us, a little quick briefing. It's like a, maybe a paragraph about the event, um, how long it's been around, that kind of thing. And then you'll want to make sure you include all of your sort of your stats of um, like if you are raising money for an event, I mean, for a for a nonprofit, then, you know, you want to put like how much you've raised or um, uh, maybe a little bit about the nonprofit. I would put a whole paragraph or, or I mean, I would put a whole page or anything about that. How many people attend? 
you know, how much it costs to participate, how you sign up, how you participate, kind of the general information you would find on a website about your event, but you just don't want them to separate and have to go searching for that information. Um, then you may want to put in some general need to know info. Like if you have a concert, perhaps you're going to put your lineup. Um, you know, things like that. If it's a race, you're going to put, um, maybe it's some interesting information about it. Like, you know, see 80th year or something like that, or you don't include anything. That's fine too. Uh, then you'll want to make sure you have your demographics in it. As I always say, you know, about your audience, what do you know about them? That kind of thing. And then after that, you're going to put in your proposal. Um, and the way that I always suggest doing that is you do, a page or two, depending on how many options you're doing with clearly marked, you know, option A, and then you clearly list what they're going to get. And if you have your names for stuff, because people do, you know, like maybe they're calling it the, maybe it's like the bullpen or, um, cause we have a festival that has that or, you know, you're like, well, what is it? You know, if, if I don't know anything about your event, I'm like, what, what is a bullpen? I don't know what that means. So you want to make sure you make it really clear what they are. And then if they have a weird name like that, explain a little bit like what that is maybe. And then you kind of list out overall what it is you're going to get with the price tag. Now, let's say I, I say bullpen sponsorship and then um, I want to describe what that is and share pictures and things like that. So what I'll, I will do is just say, see asset page for details. And then the asset page I connect underneath or behind it will be all about what that is. Like, you know, the bullpen is a premier area right in front of the stage. And, um, it has, uh, opportunities for you to brand, you know, these fence lines, or it includes this kind of stuff, you know? So, um, and then with pictures, so that way you have one page that sort of overviews what your proposal is all about and how much it costs. And then if you have specialty de de details about like what the bullpen is or what your t-shirt has, or, you know, sometimes I'll do a t-shirt assets page that has a t-shirt and shows like what the logos look like on it, or I'll show pictures of all the people running in those shirts or, you know, things like that, and then put some details on it. Then you can add that to kind of flush out some of those bigger assets. You don't necessarily need to do it for every single thing on the line. Like I don't need to put every single social post in the back of a, on an asset sheet, but I can say, you know, three social media posts. That's the other thing is you need to say numbers. You need to tell them how many you can't say inclusion in social media posts. That's, that's worthless to most people. You need to tell them what they're going to get. So are they going to get a minimum of three social media posts? You know, things like that, then that works. Is it going to be social media and post inclusions or is it going to be that, um, that it's content that they provide? So is it, you know, three posts for sponsor provided content or is it included and three posts promoting the event? So those kinds of things, those distinctions make a difference. Um, and also make a difference in pricing as well. So those are things to keep in mind. Um, so then once you kind of write, do the overall sort of, this is what you're going to get for this price tag. And then you have the, your sort of your asset sheets that maybe describe some of those things. And of course, I just put another page at the end that reiterates the contact information, how they can get a hold of us. Um, and we go from there. So that's kind of, you know, what you should be looking for. And if people, um, I'll also give you a link for some resources where you can actually download like a, um, a guide that shows you how to do that kind of stuff. Awesome. So you mentioned there, you have a kind of like summary page for the proposal. You list the stuff, then, you know, other pages, you can, you know, almost like an appendix, you can elaborate on it a little bit. On that page, you mentioned showing a price for that proposal, right? Yes. Yeah. Are you are you breaking out individual? No. no. So you're just no. like, it's like <laughs> one line item, you know, like $4,000, whatever. That's it. Yes. You can, I suggest having those prices on the back end, 100%. I would totally suggest doing that so that you know what your market, what your value to each of those assets are. And you can definitely, for us, uh, a lot of times what will happen is we will put those together. And I would say, I would say 75% of the time, if I put all the assets together and added them up, they're actually more expensive than if we um, price them as a group. I find uh, what I tend 
to find out is that if we itemize things like that, then people start to go through and mark out the pieces that they they are willing to lose in order to drop the price. Like a shopping um, and, list. Yes, exactly. And it isn't a shopping list because a lot of your pieces have to work together to achieve that goal. Um, so you have to you have to do it as a package that the as a whole is what's going to help achieve the goal that you're after. If you start marking things out, it's like baking a cake. If I go through the list and I'm like, you know, the eggs are too expensive, the oil's too expensive, then all of a sudden my cake crumbles. So you have to have um, all the ingredients to make that, that marketing plan work. Um, and if you have things that you can just start removing and it's going to work fine, then, I, then you're probably not putting together the right kind of combination. So I, I, um, I highly suggest you just do it by price. This also helps you later when you need to negotiate. Cause right now we're at a starting point. And in fact, like you say, yeah, I mean, I guess you do have to have those line items when you do your, your kind of like asset audit, right? Because you need to know when you put them together, unless it's finger in the air, how you're going to price the bundle, right? You need, you need to know what each of those worth and to be able to defend it, as you say, if the sponsor comes back and they're like, why, you know, $10,000 for, for all of these kinds of things, you, you, you can have an argument for that. Right. There's a question I had within this context of what you describe, which is kind of like, I think what most people would be more familiar with when thinking of a sponsorship proposal. If I have a really cool off the charts, can't put into a single row type of initiative, right? I want to do something really, really special for the sponsor. And I want to, and I want them to, to, to know that I'm sort of like going out of my way. I understand their objectives and I have an awesome idea. How do I present that in there? That can sometimes be challenging because once you've stepped out as sort of the generic or the general, these are the, you know, the 20 pieces of things I can offer you that are very traditional to what you've always been doing. Then when you want to create some sort of activation, we we have a few events where we get that's the majority of the really large money comes from creating these activations or developing something just for them. So when you're dealing with things like that, trying to put together, you know, using pictures or a narrative to sort of to kind of giving a story of what it is you're trying to achieve will be helpful. So instead of just listing a bunch of stuff. So for example, we were doing, we, we started with this a bank brand. It was a credit union brand for another music festival. And they were like, we want something to do. We want to develop something that will encourage people to, they were just coming into this this market and they wanted to encourage people to sign up for their credit union or their bank. And um, we want to come up with a great way to do that. Well, how do you do that with a music festival? It's kind of a weird mix, you know, um, having them sponsor an ATM that makes sense, you know, having them be on a stage, maybe that makes sense. But how do you get people engaged and want to be a part of a music, a uh, part of a bank while they're at a music festival? So we had to create this idea. And the idea we created was that we would, we would do a, area that was um a specialty sort of viewing area like a like a deck that that their members could go in and watch the show and have a place to sit down and, and so we created this whole new zone for them that wasn't part of the festival and that we had to describe and explain to them what we were trying to achieve out of it. And, um, and then they would get what we called member perks. So maybe they get a 10% discount off of the tickets originally, and then maybe they get, um, a chance to come into the zone and then maybe they can win upgrades, you know, things like that. So coming up with that, we had to pretty much draw this picture of what was going to happen. So when we presented it, um, because we'd never done it before. I didn't have photos of it, you know? So what I did was we looked at different sort of VIP areas that we've seen at other events. We looked on the line, we came up with some ideas, we priced it all out. We figured out how much it was going to cost to build it up. And we used photos to kind of showcase, this is sort of what we're thinking. And then we wrote out the narrative, like, um, you know, be a part of the chart way 
uh, member zone, this is going, uh, this will allow your members only for the, you know, to be able to enjoy the show. And we wrote it out so that it was kind of, I guess, sexy, and then also explained um, how it would work. And then we used photos to kind of showcase what our thoughts were, how we would plan it out. And doing that is what got that. And they've now been doing that for, uh, we're on our fourth year now with that program. So um, showcasing it like that can help do it because it can be somewhat, it can be difficult when you're trying to pitch an idea that's sort of out there. The other thing I will do too is if it's something like that's a little bit more complicated, I'll send it ahead and then say, um, here's the proposal. If you have some time, like we can hop on a call and I can ex- walk you through it or explain it to you. And a lot of times when it's something like that, they will definitely, you know, spend the time to do it because once they read it, they're like, okay, this is kind of interesting. And they have questions. And so they'll, they'll make the time to walk through it like that. And I always offer that to anybody. When we send a proposal, we always say, you know, if you have any questions, concerns, you know, want to change anything, want to adjust anything, let us know, we can call and make adjustments or, you know, if you want more of something and less of something else, you know, we can, we can work through it. So let me try and translate that uh, last bit, which I think is, was, was quite smart in kind of like race terms. It's almost like getting a bank to sponsor like a physio tent at the finish line or something like that. Right. Where only, where, you know, like you have like an HSBC or a chase or someone and they sponsor that. And basically only their customers can go in there. Right. So and and, yes. and they get involved in the event that way, which is quite interesting, actually. When you send out this um, sponsorship proposal, sort of what happens next? I guess it should take some time from the sponsor to get back to you. Are they supposed to tell you or is it a good sign if they told you immediately upon receipt of it that, you know, I'll get back to you in a couple of weeks? They gave you some kind of like, how do I handle radio silence? Right. I've reached that point. I'm really eager. I think the sponsor likes this. I think they've engaged because, you know, we've been through the intro deck, the call, the the discovery session, all of that stuff. And then it all sort of like, you know, goes silent for like two, three weeks. That is the worst. (laughs) Is is that something that happens? Yes, it does happen. And it happens to us. And we've been doing it for years. And we even have you know, a lot of these agency relationships already. So a lot of times it's like, you know, the person on the other end and and they still aren't getting back to you. It can be frustrating. I will tell you that I would say probably 80%, once you have the discovery call, I would say the average is probably 80%. They get back to me. Now it may not be the answer I wanted. It may be a no, but once I've had that engagement with them, the likelihood of them completely ignoring me from that point on, it, it, it goes down a lot. They, they, they tend to at least say, oh, well, not this time or the client, because you'll find later too, that a lot of the brands are represented by agencies who make these kinds of decisions for them or work with them. And so they'll come back and say, you know, I, uh, there, this isn't going to work for this year, that kind of thing. So you'll, you'll hear back, especially if you use a discovery call, it is more likely that you will hear back from them if you've had a discovery call versus when you haven't. Um, but if it happens, we continue to follow up. So, um, you just say, Hey, you know, Susie checking in on that proposal I sent last week, wanted to see if you had any feedback. Susie doesn't get back to you for another, you know, week or two. Email again. Hi, Susie. Just, you know, checking in one more time. I know you guys must be busy. I'm just curious if you have any interest in this. Nothing back. You, I, we do it again. Like, so we will, I mean, if we've done the discovery call and we reached out four to five times afterwards, we still don't hear anything, then, then we will sometimes write it off. But in the same book, that science of selling book that I was talking about, um, you know, it usually takes seven touch points before uh, people will buy in. So we have had cases where we have totally written something off and then um, and then they come back and say, sorry, it took so long. I was trying to get this approved or whatever. And then they and then they have they're all in. So that has happened before. I mean, that happens actually more than I thought it would, but it does. Um, You don't hear from them forever. And then all of a sudden they want to do it or they're trying to figure out their budgets. But most, most of the time, if they've had that call with you, it may not be that they get back to you right away, but within, you know, if you keep following up with them, they're going to get back to you and tell you one way or the other. 
On the flip side of that, when they do, if it's a no, um, or not this year, or the client is not really sure this is a good fit, or we don't have the budget or whatever, um, ask them. If they don't tell you like the reasoning behind their decision, you, I, I always suggest going back and saying, um, oh, you know, totally understand. Thank you so much for spending your time. If you wouldn't mind, could you, could you share the feedback with, as to why this wasn't a good fit for you? Just so we, we, we know on our end. And, um, a lot of times that feedback is, I, I don't try to, there are some salespeople who like to sort of argue sales with um, somebody when they say no, then they're like, well, you're missing this and this. I I don't get very aggressive on stuff like that. I feel like they've sort of made a decision. And when you do that, all you're doing is pissing them off 90% of the time. You're not usually turning them around. But if you can understand what it is that they're, um, what's, you know, what, what the pain point was or why they didn't do it, then you can always keep that in mind for next year when you follow up with them. Oh, well, they thought it was too expensive or um, we're too late in their budget. So we need to make sure that we, you know, pitch er earlier or, you know, and the other thing we'll always ask too is like, when's a good time to reach out for next year? You know, things like that. So keeping them engaged, having the conversation, being polite when you get the rejection and not just ignoring that too, because I always try to, uh, to when they take the time to tell me one way or another, I always try to engage with that because they took the time and we all know how annoying it is when you can't, when you don't hear anything. So um, having them come back to you and say, sorry, we're going to pass this year. And you're saying, oh, totally understand. Can we ask, you know, what the, you know, what the feedback was on it, you know, why you want to pass. Then a lot of times you find out later that it has nothing to do with you. It has nothing to do with your event. It has to do with budgets or maybe it's the timeline of where your event is or, you know, so knowing that kind of stuff is also helps you in the future. Yeah. And I, I also agree that, you know, in most cases, trying to argue with a no is pretty pointless. I mean, you know, it's not going to get you anywhere. In fact, what's going to happen is that because you sort of put someone on the spot and they, you know, maybe feel a little bit uncomfortable, they won't even, I think, in some cases, give you the true honest reason why they decided to not go with it, right? They'll give you something to just get rid of you. Whereas I think the best you can do in those situations when they've decided to not take the sponsorship is to at least, which is very valuable, to at least get them to give you some good feedback. I think that's, you know, which, as you say, you can use next year or on another on another sponsor. And you need to make them comfortable that saying no is going to be totally respected for them to get to the point to actually open up about why these things uh, didn't work out. In the event that someone comes back wanting to negotiate price, right? They want to, you know, they want to haggle a little bit. And some people actually, I think they, they do this as a sport almost, right? They're like, you know, yeah. <laughs> even if they're going to go yeah. ahead, right? They want to they yeah. try and maybe feel like they're getting better value, right? And they'll say, uh, you know, 10,000, you know, I was thinking more like eight or seven, right? They give you a deep discount on something. How'd you handle that? So for us, um, we kind of decide on what it's worth because this does happen a lot. I mean, and this happens with our national brands or, you know, that kind of thing. They'll come back and they'll say, okay, they, the, they want, the client wants it, but they only have a budget of $8,000. And let's say what I pitched was 10. Then what we normally do, there's a couple of ways to handle it. Um, what I've done and I, I'm a big proponent of adjust your assets don't just drop, don't give them the same thing for a cheaper price. You don't want to do that. Now, if it's like they're buying a bigger package and it's, you know, um, like with our, with Hood to Coast and with what we work with, like we have a series plus we have the big race. And sometimes what we'll do is, well, like maybe it's the whole big package is twenty thousand dollars let's just say and they come back and they say we only have eighteen thousand then we might say okay we'll we'll because it's the bigger package we'll go ahead and discount it by the eighteen thousand for this year or just so you can check us out so that we know that you can because if you do that if you set a precedent of that from the beginning and it will become incredibly hard to get those sponsors who are negotiating it down to move up 
So if you don't de if you do not take away assets from what you're proposing for the price, then you're devaluing those assets. So what we'll do is say we can adjust it to um, we can adjust it to eighteen thousand dollars, but we're going to have to adjust how many social media posts you get, and also like maybe you're only going to get one email blast. Like, yes, we can make your budget work, but this is there are a couple of things we're going to have to remove from it to make it work. Um, a lot of times they're fine with it. Like we really, you know, or what we'll do sometimes too is behind the scenes, it's like, yes, I would totally sell that for 18. Like, you know, so in your head, you're thinking, yeah, that's, it's not a big deal on our end. We'll do, but what you want to do is retract those items so that you can actually grow in the future. If you're giving them that same price and they know at that point that they're always going to be able to negotiate those prices with you. The other thing you need to be willing to do also is understand the value of your time and also understand the value of your event and be willing to say no as well. Because just because someone says, I'll give you $1,500 for this, doesn't mean you need to take it. So, um, that happens to us quite a bit too. Like, I mean, I just had a really, uh, a deal that was a $10,000 deal with a really major brand. And they came back to me and said, um, we, we want to do this, but we only have 1500 bucks. Well, it's not going to happen, you know? So I have to come back and say, there is not a package that I can put together for you. That's $1,500. Our event minimum is $5,000 for sponsorships because at that time, I mean, to be quite blunt, it's just too much work. Um, the event isn't making any money off of, off of $1,500 because of the size of that event. So, um, although you think you may be doing a favor by giving us, you know, three cases of water, it isn't, um, it's cheaper for us to just go buy this damn water than it is for us to, to do the work at $1,500 for $1,500. Because the work is the same, you guys. I mean, sometimes it's a little, sometimes the smaller sponsorships aren't as tedious, but you're still doing the same amount of work that you would do for a large sponsorship that you would do for a small sponsorship a lot of times. You still have to collect all the logos. You still have to make sure all their branding is correct. You still have to, you know, fulfill their sponsorship. You still have to get the agreements. So sometimes I think what happens is events get so wrapped up in making sure they have cash that they don't realize that it's probably, it sometimes it's not fiscally responsible to even take the deal. So that's, that's something else to think about as well. Yeah. And, and again, broader, I guess, life lesson here. You need to be able and comfortable to say no under certain circumstances, right? I mean, obviously, it's easier said than done in some contexts when there's lots of pressure and you need to meet goals and all that. I mean, I understand it, it can be tough, but you know, it's, it's, the, it's the A and Z of going into any kind of negotiation, being able to say no and entertaining the option that you have to be able to say no at some point, as you say, you know, you gave someone ten thousand, and they and they come back and you accept fifteen hundred. I mean, what does that say about your pricing? You know what I mean? I mean, you know, you yes, sold absolutely. them ten, and you're taking one and a half. I mean, there it's going to be crazy after that. I mean, accepting an eighty five percent discount. What does that say about about your proposal and and your approach to things? Right. So, assuming that you clear that hurdle as well. Both parties are happy, which is great. How about documenting everything? I think I was reading in your book and you take a very by the book approach to this in terms of drafting agreements and being really specific about stuff. Just for a sec, tell me, what would you recommend for a smaller event who may not have the ability to, you know, go and retain a lawyer and get them to like, you know, draft a custom agreement and like, is there, is there a line maybe to be drawn in all that? So basically, you know, you do document things quite rigorously, but without maybe having to, you know, put up a couple of thousand dollars for a lawyer. Yes. So, okay. So I guess the thing that I want to start with is in this day and age, um, especially in the U.S. and in other areas, if you're having a, a large gathering event, you really should have an agreement because you need to be able to protect yourself um, and, and more aspects than just um, 
the sponsorship itself. But um, events should be very aware of of their liability and different and in different situations, as well as making sure they have insurance that is covering them and and some of these other aspects too. So. If you don't have those things in place, they're very, very important and they're worth the investment. If you can't make that investment, it may not be the best thing to do is to have a large gathering or any kind of gathering like that. So with that said, the other flip side to that is with the pandemic across the world, we learned um, the hard way because we spent um, a full year just on educating events all over. I think I did like 52 webinars with um, associations across everywhere on how to unravel your sponsorships when the events were canceled. So it, that was a big red flag of how many events did not have their self situated. Now, not that I think there's going to be, I mean, hopefully another pandemic that's going to shut stuff down, but what it did is it made it very clear that a lot of events don't have an understanding of what to do when their event gets canceled. It could be anything. It could be for any reason. The other thing too, is that if you're involved in brands, you could find out later that the brand you're involved in is one you don't want to be associated with. Like if something happens or, you know, this is probably a complete, I just, and this is why this is on top of mind is because I was, I was just watching this documentary about Jared from Subway and, and, you know, he ends up become, you know, having to go to prison. But the thing is, is if you had Subway as your brand and then something like this happens and um, you don't have a contract and there's a lot of other things going on, I mean, you could actually step away from a brand like that because, you know, the morality clause or whatever. So agreements not only protect your event in all kinds of situations, but they also make sure there's no breach of contract. And it also makes sure that all of your stuff is Um, very clearly stated. So I don't know how many of you, because I worked with a lot of events at the beginning, but there was a, I dealt with a lot of sponsors who at the last minute started asking me for all these extra things, Um, especially with the music festivals. um, It'd be like, can I get more tickets? Can I get a VIP? Can I get this and this? And when you have an agreement that's clearly outlined, that stuff gets law. I mean, that stuff goes away for the most part. The other thing too, is that you're very, This notion of, um, oh, you're on social media posts. It clearly states what they're getting, that kind of stuff. Um, So I guess in a roundabout way, what I'm um, saying is, yes, there can be a a sort of a middle line for brands, um, I'm sorry, for events that probably don't have the kind of money that they have, uh, that it would take to get a, a lawyer to draft it up. But I think it's worth the investment because it'll save you in the long run. If you, a lot of those brands have their own agreements. And if you do not understand how they read, I would tell you that 90% of them are going to favor the sponsor. So for instance, I had an event that had a very large sponsorship with a, with a brand. They signed an agreement that the brand gave them. And then the brand canceled on them um, 15 days before the event. Well, in their agreement, because they weren't there, they had to give back the money and then they didn't have enough time to sell in another sponsor. So there are, this happens a lot. I mean, we had a very large insurance brand um, for one of our music festivals that paid everything, that paid the money and and everything, and then they canceled on us on a tour, which left an empty spot in our event for us and our festival. But the thing is, is that we got to keep the money because we had an agreement that protected the festival and people don't think it's going to happen. Um, and I'll, I'm here to tell you it does, it does happen and it happens, you know, and it will happen when you're not prepared. So a couple things I would say is, um, one thing, and I, this is not a push, but I knew events have this problem. So they don't exactly know what kind of agreement to do. They don't exactly know what to include in their agreement, that kind of thing. So the one thing we did is I had our lawyer draw up a template agreement. Now we don't endorse it as a catch-all. You need to go 
Um, you should take it to your own lawyer, but we had them draw it up. If you get the workbook, which is $20, that agreement, which cost us anywhere about, it cost us between $2,500 and $3,000 is in there. So you have something that has been vetted that you can use. Now I am not endorsing that it's perfect for every state or out of the, uh, you know, out of country because it was written in the U S but it is a guide. It is a template of what you can use. And essentially it'll cost you 20 bucks. Now, um, if that doesn't work, I, I suggest taking it, taking it to a lawyer, it'll cut down the time too, because then they don't have to go through everything. Um, to look at that. The other thing is, um, you can do a generic one. You could kind of do a sort of a simplified version if you want to, but you want to protect yourself in some major areas. And, um, some of those things, like if you have a sponsor out there and they do something stupid, just like, you know, liability wise, you want to make sure you're protected. You know, maybe they're, have a, a tent that they didn't stake properly and it gets windy and it blows away and hits somebody or, you know, things like that. Like you need to protect yourself from those things as well. Not just making sure that you're offering that you're getting paid what you're supposed to get paid and that you're offering the same, um, you know, the, the items that you're doing, but this does also hold you accountable as the, ev- um, the event to make sure you fulfill those items and that those items are taken care of. Because that's the other thing I find with a lot of smaller events is that their fulfillment process tends to be all over the place. And that's the biggest issue as far as resigning sponsors too, is when they don't actually fulfill their things correctly. I'm sort of mentally reserving space for a whole episode on fulfillment, which is a a whole other thing, I guess. Yeah, it is. It can be a whole other thing. Yes. But it's some wise words. And, you know, I'm always reminded how litigious our societies have become these days. A good legal agreement is always, um, always comes handy. Okay, so I want to wrap up on a slightly uh, tangential topic, but I think it's really important because we've been essentially giving people lots of information through this podcast and the one before it, arming them with some basic skills, a good understanding of the whole process, how they can go about it on their own. And some people actually reached out asking me about sponsorship brokers and marketplaces and all kinds of stuff. And obviously, you guys, uh, Green Cactus, you act in some capacity uh, as a sponsorship broker or a sponsorship agency. We'll go into the into the differences between those things. So I wanted to like quickly go over that so people also understand their options with regards to brokers, which is, I guess, is someone doing lots of this stuff on your behalf. So do you want to give us a quick definition of what a sponsorship broker does in this industry? A sponsorship broker basically um, tends to have a a good one, tends to have a lot of relationships with agencies and brands already. Um, But the idea is that they go in and they broker the agreement between the festival or the property or the race um, and the brand itself. They help facilitate that, um, that deal essentially. Um, and so for most events, sponsorship brokers, like somebody like us, um, there's agencies and there's brokers. Um, there's probably more brokers, which are just the individual, um, than there are agencies like ours. So ours handles everything related to sponsorships, um, even the management on site. So we can have brands that will, will have events that can call us and ask us just to manage, all their sponsors at an event or something like that. So we do a lot more than just the actual brokering, but there are lots and lots of individuals out there who call themselves sponsorship brokers. Um, And essentially they say, I'm going to go in, I'll make all the sales for you. And then I'm going to take a commission. This can be very, there's a lot of scams out there. So that's the biggest thing I tell people a lot. I cannot tell you how many times I've had, People call me because um, they were scammed or they hired a broker and then they took all this money up front and then they never heard from them again. I mean, there are brokers who have ended up in prison uh, because that's what they do or they go in and they sell a whole bunch of events and take their money and then they're and then they're done. So you have to be very careful that you hire a reputable 
broker. Um, and a couple of, you know, red flags, I would say for brokering is making sure that you have somebody with a reputation, ask them for their references, find, have, ask them if you can talk to some of their clients or find out who their clients are. Make sure they have a really clear presence online because I'll get emails or my brain, what happens a lot of times is our, my, our events will get emails from individuals who are like, um, you know, we'd like to help you sell or we've got these uh, clients lined up who want to be a part of your event or things like that, trying to get them to, um, to be, uh, you know, to maybe look at them for, for brokering, or they're trying to broker some specific deals. Um, go and look for those people. See if you can find them on LinkedIn. Are they connected to a lot of different people? Are they connected to brands? Are they, you know, do they have a reputation? So checking in on those kind of things, take your, do your research. Don't take their word for it. Um, and you know, the biggest thing for us, like the biggest, um, to be very honest, if they're soliciting you, I would be cautious. And the reason why is that there are not a lot of reputable brokers and agencies out there. There, So if they're like for me, for instance, for us, we have not actively sought work in probably four or five years. So I have not gone to any event and tried to get them to let us broker for them. We are like, they are coming to us or we are um, hearing about other events through word, like they're getting referred to us, like other events are referring them to us. We are not out there looking for work. So if you have people who are emailing you directly, this is a red flag. I would look for it because there's just not a lot of us out there. And we are most likely turning people down, not trying to find more events. So that's that's one that's kind of a weird red flag. But that is that is one of the things like why, you know, what is it now? Not to say that everybody is like that, but um or that there aren't some good ones out there that maybe they're trying to start a, you know, start their business or whatever. Um, but that's, that's a big one. The other thing too, is, you know, commission based, how that works, you know, fee base retainers, all those kinds of things, um, are also things you need to be aware of and understand. So, um, as far as retainers go, um, most spawns, uh, most brokers will take a retainer. Um, for us, we have a retainer, but our retainer is minimal in comparison to those that are that are kind of scamming. Now, some some brokers, depending on what type you're looking at, if you're a property broker, which means that you're doing like, you know, maybe pro sports or venues, things like that, it may be a little different. But for our type of, um, you know, for the race industry and for sort of your mid-level large event kind of thing, small events, you're looking at anywhere from 15 to 30 percent on commissions. It used to be no more than about 20 to 25, but because everything is costing more, commissions are going up a little bit as well. So um, if, you know, 15% is the minimum, if someone is wanting to do a 10% commission or 12, I mean, I would be a little weird or interested to, to see that, but, um, be prepared to pay 15, anywhere from 15 to 25, 30% on commission. Um, so that basically means that they're going to sell something in and they're going to take 15 to 25% or 30%. A sponsorship broker what bits of the process would they handle? Like, would they only go out and like, would they do the prospecting? Would they do the intro deck? Would they, would they send out the, the sponsorship proposals? Like what, what bits of that would they handle? That's a great question. Actually, I should probably have laid that out. So ours is, a, you know, I can really speak from our, from what we do. And I can also speak a little bit about what I know some of my peers do, but I can't speak for every broker. So, but in general, we charge, like I would, I'm just going to use us for an example, because I know I can speak to us. Um, we charge a fee for your deck. 
So uh, what would happen if you were to hire somebody like us, um, normally what will happen is they'll charge you a flat fee for what they call a debrief discovery meeting, whatever. They'll spend a lot of time understanding your event. They will um, usually help inventory your assets, figure out what you have to sell, help with pricing of those assets, um, and understand if you're missing the boat on certain things like, oh, why aren't we sponsoring this? Or why aren't we sponsoring that? Or, you know, those kinds of things. So we would go in, we would asset that we'd spend several hours probably with the event, trying to look at what you've done in the past, what you've done, what you're, what you should be doing and kind of also what your overall goal is. Like, do you want it? How much do you want it eventually make it to? Um, so once we understand that there's usually a flat fee for that, then they will normally, some brokers charge you for the deck. Some brokers don't, we do charge for the deck because then you get to keep it and you can do what you want with it. So if you want to use it for other stuff, marketing, if you decide later, you want to get rid of us, it's yours. So that that's also kind of some people, we also allow brand um, events to create their own decks and a lot using our guides. And then we'll go in and say, you need to adjust this or adjust this. So if they don't want to hire us to do their deck, that's fine too. So it kind of just depends. Some brokers do not do the decks. They kind of tell you what you want to do, and then they'll have you go have a designer or somebody do it. Um, so once you have that, then your broker should for their commission, be the ones that do the calling, that reach out to the sponsors, that handle um, the negotiation parts, that put together the agreement, and then um, facilitate the signing of that agreement. That is what the, the commission is for, is the actual going out, finding the people, doing the cold calling, putting together the proposals, developing that, and then leading you all the way to a signature. Now, a lot of brokers, that's the end of it. What they'll do is once you have a signature then um, and you get paid, then you get your commission. Some more agencies like us will tend to then offer services past that. So for us, we, do, we offer fulfillment services, which means we manage everything from facilitating, working with those brands at that point, collecting all of their stuff, making sure they hit all their deadlines, babysitting like that, and then making sure the event actually fulfills every single thing in their agreement. That's part of what that fulfillment service does. A lot of brokers do not manage it past that point. Um, they, they, they manage it up to the signature point and then they leave it up to the event to make sure everything happens correctly. Um, and then they, uh, and then at that point, you know, you're, it's up to you to make sure it is handled. Um, if you have a smaller event, that's probably how I would have done it. I probably would just have the broker handle up to the signature and then make sure you've got somebody dedicated to fulfilling everything. And then on the flip side of that is also, you know, you can also have services for, we will do recaps for our um, events afterwards to put them all together, reach out to all the sponsors, do their debriefs, the whole thing. So we can, we can run the gamut. Um, and then, then, then there's also people that will go out there and manage it. So I have some clients where um, we handle everything up to the signature. Once the signature happens, um, then we send it off to the event and the event handles all the fulfillment. And then we have some clients that um, we handle every single piece of it. The, the brand may never even meet anybody from the actual event. They're only dealing with our people all the way through. Now, um, that is the smoothest way to do it because then your brand is always being in connection with the same person or the same two people through the whole process and a lot less stuff gets um, falls through the cracks. That's, that's the best, but it is the more costly um, way to do it because after the signature part and that the commission no longer, the, all the other services are no longer part of that commission, then they are paid services. So it's kind of a combination of both. But a lot of brokers, like individual brokers that maybe aren't part of an agency are just handling, finding the sponsors, getting the negotiation, putting the proposals together, all that kind of stuff, and then getting it all the way up to the, to the signature of the deal. And then they sort of relinquish it. So um, brokers also sometimes will have commissions based off of multi-year. So let's say they help you sign a three-year deal and next year, the next year you decide, oh, I don't want to use that broker anymore. We can do it ourselves. You're still on the hook for paying that 
broker for the next three years on that deal. So um, depending on their deal, uh, on what your deal is between the broker, um, the agreement there. So make sure you have a really good, clear agreement and understanding of what they're going to provide to you and also what the money is. Do not take a broker who is not willing to sign an agreement with you with all of these things clearly stipulated because um, scamming is a really big problem with brokering. Um, the other thing too, is that you, if you have a retainer, we do charge a retainer. So it's minimal though. Our retainer is minimal. And then what we do is at the end of the retainer, we actually take that total amount off the end of what we earn in commission. So like if our retainer is $500 a month and we've you know, you've retained us for five months or something like, or let's just say four months to make it easy. So that's, that's, um, $2,000. Then in the end, when we're done and our commission, let's say we made, you know, $10,000 of commission, then we take those $2,000 off. So theoretically you haven't lost any money when it comes to the actual commission side of things. Um, but we have to have that in order to, be able to do all these other things. You have to get paid while you're doing it. Um, there are some brokers who will only, who will just do the commission and they'll take it at the end. It just kind of depends on who you're working with. We are not one of those. I've learned the hard way that that is not the way to do it because having a retainer means the event is way more invested in the success of the sponsorship program. Okay. Well, I don't think I have any more questions on that. It's been very informative. I think you covered everything from how it works and commissions and everything. In the very likely case, as we had on the previous episode, that people want to reach out to you either to thank you for all this information or want to have, want to follow up with you on uh, maybe some of these things. Uh, you know, maybe they want they need some like formal advice around their sponsorship efforts. How can they do that? So our website is green cactus ca like california.com um the book if it's easier to remember is sell your event book.com and that will lead you to our website as well um, we have a lot of free tools and resources guides to show you how to do these different things um, so you can check that out as well and um i'm all my handles are all at teresa stas um and it's t-e-r-e-s-a-s-t-a-s um, or at Green Cactus CA. So that's how you can get a hold of us. That's awesome. We're going to include whatever follow up documents or stuff uh, you wanna you wanna send over. Any links? Uh, we had some last time, and they were really helpful for people. So if maybe sponsorship proposal templates or whatever you have in mind that might be helpful, folks can find it uh, on the uh, podcast notes, which is great. And I'm um, tentatively penciling in a date to do a fulfillment episode because i think i think that's i think that's the only bit that's left and it's really really uh something that i think most people would be so elated by that point that they don't spend a lot of time thinking about but it's really important for the future right it's it's really important yeah absolutely Teresa, thank you very very much again for spending another hour and a half with me it's uh, <laughs> it's really a privilege thanks so much for having me i, I really appreciate it i hope Hood to Coast uh, in a couple of weeks' time turns out better than last year. Yep, it's always good. <laughs> Thank you very much to everyone listening in, and we'll see you guys uh, on our next podcast. I hope you enjoyed today's episode on sponsorship proposals with Green Cactus's Teresa Stas. You can find more resources on anything and everything related to race directing on our website, racedirectorshq.com. You can also share your thoughts about sponsorship or anything else in our Facebook group, Race Directors Hub. Many thanks again to our awesome podcast sponsor on Sign Up for sponsoring today's episode. And if you enjoyed this episode, please don't forget to subscribe on your favorite player. And do check out our podcast back catalog for more great content like this. Until our next episode, take care and keep putting on amazing races.